Here's our church mission statement. We'll read it from the beginning uh, to the end, and then we will go back to the particular one we'll be looking at today. Memorial's mission statement, seeking God's glory in every in all things and desiring to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus. We exalt God in worship, evangelize the lost, edify the saints, equip the believer to minister, encourage one another, and earnestly contend for the faith. We're going to be looking at encourage one another. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. It seems that as I got into this that there's a great deal more to encouraging one another than I had initially believed. Now, some of you that have been here for a long time have heard my messages, or maybe it's a message, message, or message, is on Barnabas. Barnabas, Bar is... Uh, in the Old Testament, it's been in Hebrew, son of, bar, son of, in Greek, uh, Barnabas, son of consolation. Consolation has changed its name, its meaning used to be uh, comfort, now it's encouragement. So, or, or excuse me, it used to be encouragement, now it's uh, comfort. Son of consolation, and talked about, we talked about the life of Barnabas and how through different methods he was encouragement to others. Uh, whenever you read son of in the Bible, it's an idiom. It means having the, among other things, but in this particular case, it means having the characteristics of. In other words, Barnabas embodied encouragement to others. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and see much, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray. Lord, as we spend this time looking into this topic, may our hearts be challenged and stirred and helped. May we learn, and then having learned, may we use what we've learned to apply it to our own lives and to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we encourage one another, we are a blessing to one another. And the idea here in incur, uh, exhorting, exhort is Old English for encourage, encourage one another, is to be a blessing to them. Now, we're going to cut this up a little bit and show how there's different ways and different methods, different ways that we bless someone and different methods we use to do so. Uh, let me begin... <coughs> Years ago, there was this song, it was a rock song, I don't even know if I ever heard it, but then people started wearing t-shirts. And the t-shirt said, and this, as, as per the song, don't worry, be happy. Well, that's pretty uppity song, kind of, you know, kind of upbeat sort of thing. But... There was no answer. There was no answer. I read a, a book some years ago by a woman who uh, had grown up in a home where one or, one or both of her parents were alcoholics and the title of the book was something to do with uh, adult parents, adult children, adult children of alcoholics. And she was really good at, at, at explaining the effects that that had on not just children as they were little, but how that growing up in a home where at least one of the parents was an alcoholic, how it, how it had affected you in adult life. Now, uh, some people say, well, uh, there's no such thing uh, as an alcoholic. Well, no, 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 no. It's a drunk. Well, no, folks, i got to tell you, there is such thing as an alcoholic, okay? A drunk is some person that's frequently drunk. An alcoholic is a person who cannot function without a certain amount of alcohol in their system. That person may not get drunk frequently, and may, may, may be, but he's never, he or she, and by the way, more women are alcoholics than men. Men are just out there more, okay? But 
this is a person that cannot, cannot get through life without having a certain measure of alcohol in their system pretty much all the time. So there is such a thing as an alcoholic. My, my apologies to anybody that wants to disagree, but I think I know more than most in this regard. Now, what, not, not that I ever drank this stuff, okay, so that's not, not the thing. All right, but here's, here's what, she had this, this nice book in which she gave all, she gave the symptoms. I don't know if they were all, but I thought it was pretty good. And then the second part of the book was how to overcome these things if they were in your life. And you know what, folks? I'm sad to say she had no answers. And she had no answers because you need the spiritual aspect to it. And she was totally secular. If, if we are to encourage one another, we must have something substantive. That silly little song, don't worry, but be, be happy. It's not, it, it, it's, it, it's not enough to say don't worry. We're going to talk in a little bit about what the Bible's explanation, the Bible's instruction, may I even say the Bible's formula for overcoming worry. The Bible is a substantive book. Amen. You know, it, it's not enough to pat someone on the back, uh, glad hand them, give, give them encouragement, just say, well, keep on keeping on, brother. No. How do, how do we get places in our lives as believers? Right here. Amen. Right here. Amen. Okay. You know, there's a, there, you can have good intentions and zero substance. Now, if I am to be, verbally speaking here, and we're going to talk about other aspects of, of, of encouragement and exhortation, but if, if I am to be an encouragement verbally by what I say, you know what I must do? must learn some Bible. And not only must I learn some Bible, but I must through life learn how to apply that Bible to my circumstances, to my situation, to my temptations, to my problems. I think it's safe to say if we can take if we can make an applicable, now, it must be applicable. In other words, you, you, it's, we have used the expression, a one-size-fits-all. There is not a one-size-fits-all Bible verse or short passage or whatever for every problem in life. The closest to that might be the attributes of God. You know, there's a danger sometimes that we can learn doctrine without learning its practicality. It was Paul's habit to begin his different epistles, for the most part, with doctrine, and then the second half of the epistle would be the application of that doctrine to, to life. If, if our doctrine is somewhere up here on a shelf, that's, that's, that's good, but it's not, it's, it would be better if we could drag some of that doctrine off and frame it into our lives and make a difference. Amen. The attributes of God ought to have some applicability, well, that not ought to, but they do have applicability to our lives to our situation, to our problems, to our, the puzzles. Now, now I'm going to tell you right away, folks, sometimes people are looking for something that doesn't exist. Hmm. In other words, what they, they want a nice, neat little package. J. 
You ever read Little Women? I think I read one of those things. Just you know, I read stuff to be well read. All right, I waded through the um, the Three Musketeers some years ago. I, I'm about 200 pages into Les Misérables, and I'm not getting any further to, toward the back. I'm trying to read it to, but it's you know, to to be well read. All right. But in, in these things, when it all ends, every orphan has a family, every person has a job, every situation is all nicely wrapped up, neatly put together so that there are no loose ends, there are, there's nothing that's not filled, there, there, every, every gap has, has a something filling it, every person with a need has it met, and so on. Life's not that way. Even in spiritual things. But God has answers. And answers are encouraging. Let us suppose that you went to the doctor and the doctor said you have X. So, not knowing a lot about medicine, if that's your situation, you say, oh. So then the doctor says, but don't worry, we have Y that takes care of X. We have this medicine, or we have this procedure, we have this operation, we have this whatever, we have this physical therapy, or we have this, we have an answer for your problem. So then you are, what shall we say, encouraged. Because when he first said it, you felt like, oh no. But then when he explained what could be done, you could say, oh, all right, good. So what am I saying here? There is substantive encouragement. In other words, current encouragement, the reason. Going back to the silly song, don't worry, be happy. Well, how can you be happy? Why should you be happy? You have this problem. The song doesn't give you an answer. It gives you what we call a bromide. It just gives you something, uh, well, don't, don't worry about this. Instead, just be happy. But I can't be happy because I got this worry. Give me something. Give me a reason. Give me a way to deal with being worried. And then I can be happy. But there's no answer. It's like the lady that wrote the book. She, she, just, she, diagnosed, she diagnosed the problem. She described the symptoms, but she had no answers. God has answers. Amen. Now sometimes the answer is a point of view. Yeah. You see, the answer... To be, the, the, what, what is to be to be encouraged is to be uplifted, to be to be changed from looking things as, as being down and, and, and being able to look up. You remember the book? I, I don't re, I don't know if I ever read the book. Yeah, I did. I did read the book. I read the book and I saw the movie too. It occurs out in San Francisco as a Norwegian family, and um, I remember Mama. And in, in, in this, Mama has a bank account. And so every Friday night after Dad gets paid, they, they meet around the table, and one child says, well, I need this, and another says, I just need this. And then, and, then, and so she doles out the money, and then when it's finished, she closes her book or whatever, and she says, good, we don't need to go to the bank. Well, the girl that wrote the book found out later there was no bank account. <laughs> There was no extra money. But everyone felt good. And why did they feel good? Because to, they thought that there was a reserve. It didn't exist. But they thought there was a reserve that would have taken care of any need that was beyond what that was there for that week. Now those people live week to week. It's not a good way to live. But sometimes people have to live that way because that's all the money there is. But, Lord, but, but you see, folks, we have a reserve that is not just something said. 
And that reserve is God. Now, in order for us to benefit from that reserve, that resource, if we might say, we must know what he is like. Well, let's, tell you what, let, let's, let, let's look at a few things. Let's, let's hold our finger here, and let's turn back to, the, to, to a psalm that everybody loves. Now, everybody loves, loves this psalm. It, 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 it makes them feel good, but in a, in a way, folks, only certain people can actually access this psalm in the truest sense of the word. That's Psalm 23. And why is, why is that? Why is it that only certain people can? Because only certain people really have God as their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's no direct object there. It's left hanging. It's left hanging because the per person who understands it knows that it includes everything. Now, in, in a way, this is the thesis statement of this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, and because the Lord is my shepherd, I will not lack for anything. And then, beginning in verse 2, he explains the role of the shepherd in the life of the sheep. I am a sheep. You are his sheep, if you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Because you see, folks, there are good shepherds and there are bad shepherds, just like there are good mothers and there are bad mothers. There are good fathers, there are bad fathers. There are good teachers, there are bad teachers. There's good, that, there, in fact, it, it, it occurred to me many years ago that there's a bell-shaped curve for everything. Alex is an is a, uh, architect. Alex, do you ever think about they're, they're bad architects? They're really bad. I don't know whether they cheated through or maybe they just, they, you know, it's all, it's all up here. They can't take what's in their head and apply it to uh, put, put it. Uh, okay, they, they, they don't know how to make, to, to make what they know here work in real life. So they're good shepherds and bad shepherds. Well, good, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, in order for him to be a good shepherd, there's a number of things that have to be they have to be there. First of all, he's got to know about sheep. You know what? If I if I went went somewhere and I bought a hundred sheep and I decided to be a shepherd, I'd love to be a shepherd for a while. If I had a bigger yard, I'd go down to one of these places where you pick out the animal and they kill it, and then they dress it and you take it home and you cook it. I'd go down there and I'd rescue a sheep. I I, I would pick out a particular sheep and say. They'd say, uh, and, and I said, no, I'm taking it home. What do you mean you're taking it home? I'm taking it home. What, are you crazy? You're supposed to eat that thing. That's, well, it's my sheep. Now I'm going to do with it what I want. And that's true. So I take it home, and, and I put it in my backyard, and I have a sheep out there. Now the, the thing is, the next door neighbor took, took down part of his fence, so my sheep would go over there in his yard. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have enough grass to feed that sheep, Okay. Uh, but if I were to become a shepherd, you know what? I don't know how good a shepherd I'd be. I, I mean, I, I, I would love, I, I'm a good dog owner. Ask the dogs I've owned. Right? They would all say, five stars, he's great. No. Now, I'm a great cat owner, but you know, you never get more than two stars from a cat. Right? <laughs> and so I would, but see, I don't know how to be a shepherd. God knows. We're made in the image of God. We are created by Him. We are designed by Him. Now, you, you men, I, I, got, I got some news for you. You don't really understand women. I think most men understand that. I got bad news for you ladies. You don't understand men. The problem is most women think they understand men better than they do. Alright? But God made us both. You know, I, I like to draw a circle, and this is the image of God, and then cut it in, in, in like this, and say, this is the female, and this is the male. And when you put them together, you have the whole image of God. And we, 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 we look for what is missing in ourselves. 
Now, it, it doesn't work perfectly. Okay? Take any couple you want and put them together, and it's not like it's a perfect fit. That's in the Hallmark movies. Okay? That's in the romance novels. It doesn't exist in real life. But God knows me. God knows me better than I know me. And God knows you better. Because He's the shepherd, He knows the sheep. And He not only knows sheep, but He knows His sheep. Because sheep had personalities. In fact, oftentimes the shepherd gives them a name. He, you know, Palestinian shepherds name their sheep. And he gives them a name that goes sometimes with, sometimes it's with their body, and sometimes it's with their personality, sometimes it's with their habits. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He knows sheep. He knows what they need. And then it goes down through here, and it describes the things that the shepherd does because sheep... There, uh, there's, there, there are some things that, that run through all sheep. They don't like moving water. They like still water. They don't lie down until they're content and secure. They don't. Otherwise, they're up and about and they're nervous. So where it, where it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, is God is able to give us a contentment that cannot be found any other place. Amen any other person, in any other circumstance. And it just, if we, we, we won't spend time, this, the sermon's not about the, 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 the 23rd Psalm, but here we see, and so this should be, if you could took nothing but Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then you understand a little bit about the psalm and, and, and that he, he is the provider of all that is needed. James 1.17 says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shall return. In other words, it wasn't, that wasn't true in James' day, but it's not true in our day. Every good gift is from God. You know, you know folks, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I've dragged a few into my life that weren't so great. Why? Because they weren't gifts of God. They were gifts of my own choosing. They were things that I went after. And they did not, they were not advantageous. Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? And yet the answer there is it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. Why? Because God is mighty and God is benevolent and God is everywhere and God loves me. Amen. You see... You can say that. You can say that to a person that where this fits. He, maybe this person is dealing with a, a hostile family. Jesus talked about this. I have seen it. If you've been in Christendom very long, you have seen it. Somebody gets saved. I, I, I know a man. I know a man. He got saved. His, life, his wife left him. She left him. She, she, didn't, she was not willing to stop partying. She, she wanted to do what she wanted to do. She didn't want a Bible-quoting husband. Now, he's good to her. In fact, even though there, she divorced him, he still does things for her. But if God be for us, it really doesn't matter who's against us. Because, for one thing, no one can harm us without God's permission. Amen. How about first? Uh, how about First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, what is it? Where is that? That's at the end of the great resurrection chapter. 
it, 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 most immediately he talks about one day we are going to be perfect. This body, this de decaying weak is, Paul described it in, uh, I think it's Philippians 3.21, who shall change this vile body. And when he says vile, what he's talking, what's he, th 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 this body is really pretty rickety. Now the older you get, the more rickety it gets, okay? But I mean, you, you, you got to sleep. You got to eat. Your body is relatively fragile. If we take it up high enough, you can't breathe. We take it down into the water, you can't breathe. You can only stay up there so long, you can only stay down in the water so long. You can only stay awake so long, you can only do without food so long, you can only do without water for a certain period of time. And in any, any of these cases, you die. We could do things and to you and, and, and after a certain period of time uh, we would have to put you in a, in a padded cell and you would run back and forth between the walls bashing your body against that. But one day we're going to be perfect. And all, not only is it just, it's described, you know folks there are very few things in the Bible described all in one place. You, you know it's you have to go here and there and find it. For example, in 1 John, 1 John 3, it says, well, for Philippians uh, 3, 21, who should change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. His resurrected body. Yes, it's a body, but it's different than the one that was before. It tells us in, in, in 1 John uh, that we should be like him. 1 John 3, we should be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It tells us in 1 Corinthians that this corruptible will put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass that saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Jesus has vanquished them. They have no claim on me and on you. Yes, the day may come if the Lord tarries that death will come and I must say yes. Jesus was the exception. He says in John chapter 10, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life. No man taketh it from me. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. I can't say that. I don't know how I'm going to die. I have my choices. I, my, it's my intention to die at an advanced age in my bed, in my sleep. Do I get to choose that? No. Nope. I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't know when. It, and it should it come, there's not a thing I can do about it. But that's not the end. Sometimes people are worried about having what they need. Well, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6 for a moment. This is, of course, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Beautiful, beautiful words, but even better. They are substitute. I've been the, to the place where they say they were spoken. I, I don't buy it. I, I believe that they were probably delivered at the horns of that team what we call the horns of that team, what we call that in that day, of course, it came to, came to be because of the uh, battle there in, uh, on July 4th, 1187, where, where the, the Muslims under, um, oh, they just came through my head, defeated the Crusaders. But anyway, verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or yet for your body what you shall put on. Now, he's not saying, he's saying, don't worry. Last night, 
I got my clothes ready for today. I'm a big advocate of that. And why is that? Because one of the reasons is I want to come to church in the proper mood. I don't want to be grousing in my, in my soul because I couldn't find uh, something that I, that I want to wear. So I got a tie, I got a shirt, I got my suit. Uh, I didn't put my overcoat where I normally put it because someone else was already there. And, and all the things I was going to put on, uh, I, 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 I put, prepared my shoes. I stuck the socks I was going to wear, one in each shoe. It's all ready to go. All right? So I did take thought. And there, there are times when I say, oh, you know, I, well, my wife usually says, you need a new this. And I say, no, I don't. She says, yeah, you do. I said, well, not yet. And so, but at some point, she's right. And so I got to get another one. So it, it's not that when take no thought, that means take absolutely, positively no thought. But it means don't worry. Don't worry. Why should I not worry? Well, it's very simple. It, it, said, it says, verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air. But they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and toil not. Neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. You ever seen one of those flowers? Boy, if, you, if you've ever been to the uh, tropical area, that, uh, that they've got the most outrageous flowers and you look at it and, 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 and you you know by the way look at things carefully you look at it and you just study it for a, a half a minute or a minute or so and it's like wow Solomon with all the money he had he looked near as good as one of those flowers and what's a flower it doesn't last very long Sometimes they'll, the, the, the blossoms will last for a goodly period. Uh, Root's got a hydrangea out in the backyard. I think they last pretty much all summer. But then they're gone. And yet, God put all that beautiful artistry in something that at the very best lasts for a season. Where so, verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Take therefore no thought. In other words, don't worry. Say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Verse 34, take therefore no thought. Don't worry for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things that are sufficient unto the days and evil thereof. What does, he, what does he mean when he says sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof? The word evil there doesn't mean moral evil. It means bad, unpleasant, difficult. Well, let us suppose that this, this turns out to be an easy day. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means that's all the trouble God wanted you to have today. And then maybe uh, in a couple of weeks you have a really awful day. You know one of those days where you... You, you roll out of bed, you put your feet on the floor, and immediately the trouble starts. I mean, man, you put your foot on a tack. I mean, it just starts out bad. And all day long you have one small calamity after another. Could a calamity be small? I don't know. We'll have to consider that. But you know what I mean? It's not a good day. Now, if today when I have a pleasant, easy day, and I don't know what it's going to be like, so far it's been so good, then... If I'm worried, oh man, I don't know about tomorrow. I mean, you know, I only got X amount of money in the bank. I, maybe I'm going to run out. I don't know. You, know, you, know you, you, you see, you understand that sufficient unto the day is the, God gives me grace for now, for this day. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul has prayed that God will take away his thorn of the flesh. And God said no. 
And he says, my gra God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And what is Paul's response? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Now, folks, i got to tell you, and if you, tell, if you want to tell me something different, I'm not going to believe you. We don't like to hear that. I, I have a sneaky suspicion Paul wasn't real keen on it either. But he was willing to allow his strength, his triumph to be God's, knowing that he was deficient, and we are deficient, folks, but God is sufficient. Now, what are we talking about here, folks? See, see what we're, see what is here. This is encouragement because it has a basis, a substantive basis, which answers one after another the situations, the difficulties of life. This is how we encourage one another. Not a pat on the back and some little. Bromine expression. Now, God has reasons for us to be encouraged. That is what we give to the one who needs encouragement. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we serve a great God. Lord, you are great in power but you are also great in love. You are great in provision. You are great in understanding. You are great in details. Oh Lord, how you, how you seem to love to do things for us. I'm reminded of Psalm 37, 4, where it tells us, He that we, we Delight ourselves also in the Lord that you give us.